The Warehouse was an American retail music franchise that opened in 1970 and closed in 2003. If you've clicked onto this video, then you know what today is. It's Throwback Thursday. Every Thursday, I'll be releasing a new video of an old video that I did before. These new videos are longer and have more detail than the ones before. If you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button and smash that notification bell so you get notified of my latest video. Be sure to leave a comment or a suggestion for a future video. Thanks for watching. Come to the warehouse and rent the hit movies you want when you want them with the warehouse movie rental guarantee. This week, the warehouse guarantees you can rent Big Crocodile Dundee 2 and Cocktail starring Tom Cruise. If we don't have a copy available, we'll give you a coupon for a free rental for one of these three hit movies. Only the warehouse offers you the movie rental guarantee. If you want to rent these hit movies, they'll be at the warehouse guaranteed. Where? The warehouse. Warehouse was founded in 1970 in Gardena, California by Leon Hartstone. Hartstone named the parent company of his fledgling chain called Integrity Entertainment Corporation, while the stores themselves were called The Warehouse. The warehouse chain grew quickly, and at the end of its first decade in business, over 100 stores were in operation across most of its current geographical territory. At the same time, however, Integrity Entertainment was also losing money. Thus, in 1979, Hearthstone turned to Lewis Quicker, a one-time lawyer and investment banker who was then running a music industry consulting firm in Chicago. Hearthstone initially hired Quicker as a marketing and management consultant. Quicker sold his firm, came to Los Angeles, and within a year had made such an impression on Hearthstone that the company's founder appointed him president in 1980. In 1982, however, Hearthstone died after undergoing heart surgery, and under the terms of his will, his estate was directed to sell Integrity Entertainment's assets for cash. Hoping to acquire the company himself, Quicker formed an employee stock ownership trust, and while Hearthstone's estate negotiated unsuccessfully with potential buyers, Quicker secured a $7 million loan for the trust, enough to cover the entire purchase price of the company from Bank of America. The trust then stepped in and acquired all of Integrity Entertainment, using its assets to secure the debt. Quicker retained a 37% interest for himself, enough to maintain control of the company, and he immediately became CEO. Under Quicker, the company's name was changed to Warehouse Entertainment Corporation, and the headquarters was then moved to nearby suburb of Torrance. The company also embarked on a program of expansion. At the time of Hearthstone's death, the warehouse had 130 stores, and by the end of fiscal 1985, that number had grown modestly to 142. That year, Business Week named Warehouse Entertainment one of the 100 best companies in the United States, with annual sales of less than $150 million. Two years later, however, the warehouse had more than doubled in size to 295 stores, and sales reached $225 million. At the same time, the chain proved quick to adapt to its radical shifts in recording technology. Phasing out long-playing records as compact discs became the wave of the future. Although not as steeply. Uh, as we saw the drop from For me, I remember the warehouse being one of the first places where you could actually buy UCDs. I remember them selling them as low as $1.99 each. They also sold used LP cassettes as well. And speaking of cassettes, do you remember the cassette singles? They used to sell them for three for $9.99. I remember getting these three cassette singles for my eighth grade graduation. 
The company also moved into sales and rental of videotaped movies, and by 1987, it had become one of the two largest video retailers in the nation, vying with the East Coast-based Errol's video club chain. In order to keep up with the shifts in entertainment software media, the company insisted on maintaining relatively large facilities. Therefore, unlike most chain retailers, the warehouse shied away from locations in regional malls, preferring sites that were either freestanding or in strip malls. The overhead costs associated with rapid growth and higher effective tax rates began to depress company profits in 1986, and depressed profits left the company vulnerable to attempts at leveraged buyouts and hostile takeovers. With that being said, Warehouse became the target of a hostile takeover bid by Shamrock Holdings, a Burbank investment company owned by Roy Disney and his family. Acting as a so-called white knight, Adler and Shaken paid $118 million for the warehouse. At the time of the acquisition, Warehouse was a chain of more than 200 stores, mostly in California. However, the white knight that Quicker had courted soon proved his undoing. In March of 1988, Quicker was forced to leave the company by Adler and Shaken. Soon after taking over the company, the new president drastically changed the warehouse's merchandising mix, increasing the number of video cassettes of popular movies fourfold. The move paid off. More customers came to the warehouse once they realized that the chain was certain to have copies of the movie they most wanted to rent. The benefits of privatization did not entirely outweigh the burden of the leveraged buyout. In the early 1990s, fiscal problems created by stiff competition from blockbuster video and recession in the California economy were only made worse by the high interest payments that Warehouse Entertainment had incurred through the Adler and Shaken buyout. Not surprisingly, Adler and Shaken were forced to sell Warehouse Entertainment in 1992. The buyer, a group of senior management backed by Merrill Lynch Capital Partners, paid $250 million for Warehouse. Warehouse Entertainment continued to lose money throughout the following year due to continuing recession in California, competition from Blockbuster Empire, and interest payments on its long-term debt. Looking for a way to increase sales and customer traffic, and unable to overtake Blockbuster in video rentals, the company shifted emphasis in 1993. The company's decision to begin buying and selling used compact discs brought both opportunity and controversy. The market for secondhand music recordings had a long history, and the small stores that had always traded used records and cassettes had already started retailing used CDs. However, the warehouse was the largest chain to enter the business. Warehouse had first experimented with selling used CDs in 1999 when, Concerned by customers' discontent over high CD prices, it began allowing customers to return CDs for a full refund for any reason. Alarmed by the warehouse's new policy and similar moves by other retailers, Sony Music Distribution's arm stopped allowing retailers to return CDs for which the packaging had been opened. Unable to return Sony CDs, the warehouse instead sold them at reduced prices, much to the delight of the customer. The market for used CDs, however, presented the music industry with a threat that used album sales never had. Secondhand records had offered consumers a trade-off, reduced price for reduced sound quality caused by wear and tear on the recording. However, CDs didn't suffer much from use since they required no mechanical parts, such as tape heads or phonograph needles, except they did scratch and they did skip when they were scratched. Therefore, large quantities of good-as-new CDs could be passed between an infinite number of owners without any revenue going to the record companies or artists. In May of 1993, 
The distribution arms of four of the six largest record companies, Sony, Warner Music, Capital, EMI, and MCA, announced that they would withhold cooperative advertising money for any retailer selling used CDs. The company retaliated with a lawsuit alleging that the four major distributors had violated antitrust laws, claiming that their refusal to provide advertising support constituted an unreasonable restraint of trade and commerce. Moreover, the suit charged that distributors were acting to protect CD prices that were artificially high. Warehouse Entertainment reaped a huge publicity windfall from the controversy. It also scored a significant victory in September of 1993 when Capital EMI settled with the company, agreeing to resume cooperative advertisement. Warehouse Entertainment dropped Capital EMI from the suit and agreed not to sell UCDs of recordings currently supported by cooperative ad funds. This legal victory did not solve the problems presented by its substantial debt load and intense competition from major rivals in its field, which by this time included Blockbuster Video, Musicland, and Tower Records. In August of 1998, Warehouse purchased Blockbuster Music from Viacom. Warehouse which by that time was selling new and used music and DVDs in 23 states, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in January. The company blamed increasing competition from discount retailers, the rising popularity of CD burning, and illegal downloading of music contributed to sagging sales at its stores. In 2003, Trans World Entertainment purchased the remaining 148 warehouse stores for $41 million in cash and assumed liabilities, while closing 35 underperforming stores. It is not clear when Transworld Entertainment closed the remaining stores or converted them to the FYE brand. Today, there are about 200 FYE stores. So what are some of your favorite memories of this place? Leave a comment or a suggestion for a future video below. Be sure to hit that like button. Thanks for watching.